Welcome to this ESS revision video on topic 4.4 and water pollution. So before we do this, you need to understand that water pollution is the contamination of bodies of water by pollutants either directly or indirectly. Um, and water pollution is a serious matter globally because it kills 14,000 people a day because we all rely so much on water. It, nearly half a billion people, however, around the world still don't have access to clean drinking water. But water pollution isn't just about poorer parts of the world. It affects both um, developed countries, less developed countries, higher economic countries, less economic countries. Why is water so important? Because it's of our bodies and therefore it is critical for it to be healthy, for us to be healthy as a result. So there are different types of water pollution. Um, they, these water pollutions can be anthropocentric or natural, so we can produce them, but water can also be polluted by natural sources. Um, for example, um, animals will naturally produce waste in the wild, that will go into the water as well. It can be a point source that so can come from a precise location, or it can be more diffuse and come from lots of different places, called a non-point source. It could be organic waste going in, so manure, for example, or it could be inorganic waste, such as chemicals from a factory. It can be direct, so it can directly affect organisms, or it can react with other chemicals in the river to make new products, which will often affect the ecosystem. Freshwater pollution sources are often agricultural, sewage, industrial or domestic um, re releases, whereas marine um, often focuses on pipelines um, going into the sea, atmosphere or human activities at sea, such as oil development, for example, leading to discharges. So there are lots of different types of water pollution that I thought would be worth you just sort of seeing. Um, this isn't in the specification so much, but I think it's quite useful for you to just sort of see. So we've got um, diseases um, which could go into, this, into the water, such as bacteria and viruses. Cholera in humans was a massive disease. Um, it still is in parts of the world uh, where water isn't treated. Waste that removes oxygen from the water, sort of sewage and manure, um, will often take the oxygen out, killing the fish. Inorganic chemicals such as acids and metals from industry, um, organic chemicals, oil is cast as an organic chemical, pesticides, detergents, fertilizers cause eutrophication, sediment from where there's been trees chopped down, which causes erosion, which causes sediment to enter the water, that can cause a problem, and radiation um, from power stations, for example, as a result. So we can measure water pollution in one of two ways. The first way is using the biochemical oxygen demand, which is basically measuring accurately the amount of dissolved oxygen required to break down the organic matter in a given volume of water. So if water is polluted, it might have a lot of um, organic matter and basically using oxygen um, breaks it down because microbes will break it down. So if you've got really polluted water, you may um, need a lot of oxygen to break down the pollutants. If you've got less of oxygen needed, it's a clean water. You can also use biological indicator species. So this is generally invertebrates in fresh water and they will live in like cleaner water areas to less cleaner water areas. And we can identify which species we have where, which tells us how clean. And environmental biological indicators are often an early sign of change in ecosystems because they are the uh, most sensitive organisms. So invertebrates are freshwater and they're sensitive to oxygen concentrations. So the stonefly nymph would need high oxygen because it lives in low pollution areas. The tube effects worm will live in very low oxygen levels because it, like, it can cope with pollution. Therefore, if you see this change starting to happen, it's an early warning that oxygen levels are going down, and that is due to the bacteria that break down the sewage building up as the sewage builds up. High oxygen, remember, always means low levels of pollution. Low oxygen means high levels of pollution. The example you need to know in detail is eutrophication. And eutrophication is when we add additional nutrients to um, the stream or river, and that then causes 
um, a change in the aquatic system. Now, the potential sources of these nutrients you need to know. Most people remember sewage. Most people remember fertilizers. But any of the others are also important. So detergents, for example, like your washing machine could cause this to happen. Drainage from animal breeding systems and topsoil erosion could take nutrients into the water and that could cause um, eutrophication to happen. So what is eutrophication? Well, when we add these chemicals in, let's say from there from a fertilizer or from pollution, these chemicals cause a series of events to happen. So the first thing that happens is you get an increase, particularly in nitrates and phosphorus. That causes a growth of algae, um, which will then block the sunlight in the uh, top levels of the water. So your algae builds up here. Okay, that means that the sunlight then cannot get past the algae as a result. Therefore, the plants at the bottom will sort of die and therefore those things will die and bacteria will then also decompose those plants using the oxygen. So the bacteria uses the oxygen, which then leads to fish death as a result. Now, eutrophication has massive impacts, and here's an example is in um, America. So water coming out of the rivers in Louisiana come in, bringing all these minerals into the uh, Gulf of Mexico, and these um, this causes a huge algal bloom, and as a result, you have something called a dead zone because of a lack of oxygen, and you see the size of this dead zone is absolutely massive. Now this is caused because there is oxygen deficient water, therefore there's loss of biodiversity because nothing can survive there. The higher plants that need more light don't, can't survive because they're blocked out. Aerobic organisms need oxygen, um, die, and as a result there is increased turbidity in the water. Now you need to be familiar with management strategies across this whole course. So management strategies always split up into three areas. You have human, um, activity and we can look at how we can reduce the human activity, we can look at how we can reduce the pollution and we can look at then the long-term effects. So the strategies is we could first of all alter the human activity. So that's the, the first bit that we um, need to do. So I'll get rid of that and do that again. Okay, so altering human activity. Now, how can we do this in water pollution? Well, we can use alternative technologies that don't add the pollution. We can adopt alternative lifestyles, so using less fertilizer, less pesticides. We can reduce, uh, recycle, and reuse. We can then regulate reducing the pollution um, by redu to reduce the levels. So we can set standards in countries and we can measure them and do measurements as a result. And then once we've reduced this impact, you then need to look at cleaning up the pollution. And that means we need to go into places that have got eutrophication and remove the actual pollution, for example. And then when we've done that, replanting and restocking the biodiversity to make it as a healthier environment as it was. So the three stages you need to understand is we need to alter human activity, we need to regulate the pollution, and then we need to restore the habitat.